Good morning, Katie, Rebecca, and the person that's showing to be Sarah Malik. By now you should be able to see our title slide with the We Are the Majority Rally. And if you have a question throughout the session today, you can either uh, raise the hand with the little hand button, or you can ask a question in the question section of your GoToWebinar navigation panel. There are only a few so far that are logged in of those that, who have registered for today, so we'll just give it a few more minutes and wait for those folks to get logged in. Thank you. Thank you for everyone joining us this morning. We are just going to wait a minute or so longer for the other folks to log in. If you'd like, or if you have a question or would like to comment, you can either raise your hand in the hand section of the GoToWebinar navigation panel or ask the question in the question section. Again, we'll begin in just about a minute. As we're waiting to get started, just wanted to let you know about the GoToWebinar uh, 800 number should you have any problems. And you can call GoToWebinar at 800-788-7254. Again, that's 800-788-7254. We need the webinar ID, which is 119-949-779. Again, 800-788-7254. And the webinar ID, 119 Nine four nine seven seven nine. The webinar ID is at the bottom of your GoToWebinar navigation panel, as well as included in the confirmation emails that you got related to the webinar today. Sarah, do you want to start, get started? Yeah. 
Good morning, everyone. My name is Sarah Malik, and I'm the program manager for the Ohio Youth Set Prevention Network. And we are so excited to have you on with us today to kind of talk about, um, you know, what youth led prevention looks like for adult leaders. Um, and we have two fantastic presenters with us today, Christy Valentini and Mary Marvel, who are part of the Ohio Youth Led Prevention Network Adult Council. Um, and they're going to talk about how they got their groups started, um, what their groups look like for them. So hopefully it will be really good content for you today um, that you can take and apply to what you're doing. Um, so at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Christy. Thank you, Ms. Sarah. I'm so excited to be a part of this and hopefully we'll give you guys some good information and then also have some time at the end to do some question and answer and, and share some of our experiences. So let's just jump right in. Sarah, if you'll hit me with the next slide. We're going to kind of start this off by talking about what youth-led pro programming actually is. Um, and that will be kind of the first couple of slides that I'll take over. Um, and then Sarah and Mary will walk you through our next kind of couple of us objectives. So if you follow along, we're going to kind of talk about the science behind youth-led prevention, which is our next slide. And I don't want to spend too much time on these couple of bullet points on the slide, but just a refresher for us to kind of keep in the back of our mind as we work through this. So the risk and protective factors, we know that the more protective factors a young person has, the more likely they are going to make positive choices and, and perhaps be um, more successful in life. And then the social emotional learning, the process through which we, you know, acquire or effectively apply knowledge and attitudes and skills to, you know, understand and manage emotions and set and achieve goals and feel and show empathy. And the social development strategy. So this is a theory of human behavior that's kind of used to explain the original the origins of um, development of delinquent behavior during childhood and adolescence, and then asset development, which we use a lot with our youth coalition. And asset development came from the Search Institute, the 40 developmental assets. So you kind of have the internal and the external assets. And the more internal, external assets a young person has, the more likely they are to uh, you know, use drugs or alcohol or refrain from some risky behaviors and decision making. So that's just a quick overview of the science behind. And we'll kind of jump into what youth prevention actually is. And we all know that you know, there's so many advantages for having youth, young people involved, having youth involved. You know, being a part of a group can help young people develop important personal and interpersonal skills, help them think critically and solve problems, um, give them some leadership capabilities, you know, reduce the risk of becoming involved in unsafe activities. But we really need to be specific in what youth-led prevention is. And so I kind of use this example as we go to our next slide. So if you've heard this before, I apologize. But a couple of years ago, I was working on the fifth state grant, the Strategic Prevention Framework State Incentive Grant. And this was a grant that was focusing on 18 to 25-year-olds. And so I was at a university, a regional campus, and we had some great membership of our coalition. We had professors, and we had staff, and we had community members, um, but we didn't have an 18 to 25 year old yet. And we're kind of working through the strategic plan and making these great, assuming we were making these great plans, and we had this awesome idea that we were going to do these media messages on these great big TVs that were all through campus. And then when our group of 18 to 25 year olds came in, they looked at our plan and they're like, we don't ever look at those TVs. And we're like, okay, well, why don't you look at those TVs? And they're like, well, we have everything on our phone. Why would we look up? Why would we look at the TVs? So all of that planning we did went out the window. And so that kind of speaks to these bullets on this slide. Youth involvement in the entire prevention process is so important. You know, you have to have youth have an active voice in planning, decision making, implementation, and valuation. We came up with a really great plan. We thought we did. But once we got those 18 to 25 years old in there, they're like, that's a waste of time. We don't, we don't look at those TVs. We're never going to get those messages. So to go back to the drawing table and really work with them and say, okay, how do we get these messages out so that you will look at them, so you will actually you know, engage in that message. And that was our guiding capacity. You know, we asked their input, and we kind of said, you know, tell us what you think. And youth-led programming focuses on the building of positive strengths and attributes in young people to help them become successful contributing adults and youth hearing directly from the, their peers about how to handle issues. I can say the message a hundred times, 
and then I'll have my young person come in, and they'll say it, and the kids will be like, oh, yeah, totally. I'm like, I just said that 100 times. And we all know that. We know that peer-to-peer -peer communication is so important. So kind of you know, what we've kind of talked about and hopefully we'll dive into more later is that with youth, you really have to have this co-partnership. Um, and you know, you're providing kind of the guidance, um, and we're promoting healthy lifestyle choices. We're promoting social and emotional wellness. I mean, it's a comprehensive approach based on multiple strategies, which Sarah and, and Mary will get into more. Um, and you're going to really set measurable goals and steps. I can't emphasize this enough. I really see my youth get drawn into the program more with the more specific goals and steps that we have. If it's vague, they don't really have that buy-in and that continual evaluation, which is so important. And so we're going to kind of talk about real briefly why scare tactics don't work. And you'll see on the next slide in the bottom corner, there's a visual of why scare tactics and drug prevention messaging don't work. This is a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous document that DFAA, Drug Free Action Alliance, put out. And if you don't have it, I really encourage you to get it. And actually, I pass this out to a lot of the community sectors that sit at our coalition table. Um, and so really we know, and, and this is straight from their document, that people are hardwired to defend against negative messaging. You know, there's that denial, especially with adolescents. It's not going to happen to me. It's the avoidance. Um, it's even maybe making fun of the message. Um, and in my particular community, we're still kind of fighting this battle with mock crashes. And we found that now that we've educated our youth, our youth are really spearheading the, well, let's talk about how we can use this money uh, maybe a little bit more effectively. And so we know with scare tactics that you know, young people kind of filter information differently than adults do. And, you know, high-risk groups can be more attracted to these risky behaviors if we're using these scare tactics. And strong warning messages can send unintended messages also. So we really want to make sure that we kind of stay away from scare tactics. And just like the slides say, they can really backfire on us, and they can actually increase youth, which is what we definitely don't want. Um, it can create a lack of trust in other prevention messages. So, you know, well, you said this. And we know now that that's not true, so why should I ever believe you again? Um, and then we can overhype, you know, create that impression that, you know, more is happening than it is. And, you know, the bottom line, just like my students said, it's a waste of precious resource. You know, we, we don't have a lot out there. You guys know this. Um, so we have to make sure that every penny counts, every hour counts, every minute counts, and, you know, all those members' time at the community table, we're not wasting it um, in an effort that you know, we don't have a lot of time and we don't have a lot of energy to spend on. So our next slide kind of speaks to you know, what we know. Prevention goals cannot be achieved with recovery content or strategies. All right? So we don't necessarily want addicts to come in and speak. Um, you know, we are you know, very thankful for their message and, and they have wonderful things to say, but we know that in this prevention environment that that's not going to help us reach our goals. Um, information must be developmentally appropriate. So not too young, not too basic, not too, you know, steeped in science and educational, but, but enough for them to engage and connect with. And just providing information alone will not result in the behavior change. So this is so important. This is what I tell um, a lot of our community members sitting at the table. It's not just about the information. The information is important, um, but it's not going to show a behavior change alone. And so we really need a comprehensive approach um, that's going to cover a, a whole different strategies and initiatives, and that includes educators, parents, and communities with those youth that are sitting at our table. Um, and then so important, this is a great slide too, so uh, youth-led prevention is not us, not adults, telling youth not to do drugs. Um, it's not just recruiting, recruiting youth to a single activity. And you know we see this a lot with coalitions. It's not having that token youth on the uh, adult board that just sits there, that doesn't necessarily say anything, but we check the box that we have that youth member there. Um, it's not smoke and mirrors. It's not the youth doing all the grunt work. Um, so they're, you know, we're getting down, we're getting dirty too, we're engaging in that. And, and sometimes that's even doing the activities with the youth. I know a lot of the youth say, you know, we do it, we have fun, but we would love for you to participate too. Um, it's not an absent of adult involvement, um, and it's not just doing everything the youth want to do. Um, so it's definitely not adults providing programming for and to youth. So, you know, as you can see, it's making sure that they have a voice while we're guiding them along. And there are lots of benefits to the community when we do this. You know, We have the ability to change youth perception from the society's point of view. Um, and you can see that you know, 
with those developmental assets, having them feel connected and part of the community, having them feel like they're, you know, a leadership role in the community is one of one or more of those developmental assets will, that will really help them succeed um, and make healthy decisions. And we really want to make sure that, you know, those misperceptions of the norm are corrected, those social norming things that we have the power to change. And so the benefits of the youth prevention, youth like prevention for your program, just like the next slide says. Um, so your organizational effectiveness is increased. I, you know, if we jump down to um, the power of the youth force is harnessed, we probably know, people know us more because of what our youth are doing than anything else. Um, whether that's through social media, whether that's through the activities they have, hold out in the community, or whether it's just by word of mouth with the youth. Um, that's probably our most powerful um, way to get our message out or way that people recognize us are the youth themselves. And then additional benefits um, on our, our next slide are that the youth involved for positive youth development, just like I said in the beginning, all those leadership skills, those planning skills, those, you know, the social competence, those positive values, um, all of those things that we really want to see in our youth as they transition into adulthood to, you know, make them successful, make our community sex successful, make our program successful, all of that empowerment, which is so important. And, you know, we really want to see continue to grow and grow and grow. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to Mary, who is going to talk about some strategies. Mary, are you with us? Just a moment, everyone. Hopefully Mary's got her, her stuff on. Mary, can you hear me? Well, we'll wait a couple of minutes. I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next session, section, and then we can um, kind of go back and talk about these strategies. Um, hopefully, Mary can come on with us um, so she can go over that. And I apologize. Sometimes we have technical difficulties with these webinars. Um, but, you know, the beauty of it is that we get to bring everyone together to, um, to talk about um, things without having to be here in person. So I'm just going to advance through these, like I said, and we'll, we'll go back, so don't worry. Okay, so what I'm going to start with um, is this study that the, the Search Institute heard of, that they did. So Christy talked about um, you know, the developmental assets and that being part of the Search Institute. So um, this is a study they did. And so they use these different things that you see here on the screen, um, your personal power, community problem solving, civic involvement, comfort, expressing voice, leadership. And they use these things um, to measure teen voice. So when we're thinking about teen voice, like the slide that Christy went over earlier, um, they really did a comprehensive study to kind of go over these things. Um, and these were the key findings that they had on that. And so that's a good segue into, into the adult role, which is, which is what these academies that we're all going to um, is really going to be about. Um, the adults are so important in, in youth-led prevention. And I think oftentimes we, we say, um, you know, it's all about our kids. Our kids are doing all the work. And yes, they are doing all the work, and they're fantastic. And without them, you know, we wouldn't um, have youth-led programming. But, um, you know, you as adult, adults play such an important role um, and that's what we really want to, to capitalize on here today and, and to make you feel like, um, you know, you, you have the tools. Um, it's just about finding those youth and um, figuring out, um, you know, where, where you can place them and, and their strengths and things like that. So the role of adults, um, you know, we know this, 
we're, we're all sort, we wear all sorts of hats, don't we? I mean, um, we really work ourselves. And when you work with kids, it's not just an eight to five. We know that, right? It's, it's um, an after five kind of job. Um, so we can be many roles. We can be their mentor. Um, you know, we can be their coach and their supporter and, and encourager. Um, and they need that because um, in order to build their skills, um, you know, we need to make sure that we're that support. I know when I actually grew up in youth-led programming, and I know when I was in youth-led programming, um, I had an incredible mentor um, that really helped me develop my leadership skills and showed me that, um, you know, I had the capabilities, I had the tools, I just had to build a competence within myself. And so I think we as adults um, wearing all these hats, it is so key. It is so key because without us and without um, you know, our knowledge and our tools, um, they wouldn't be able to accomplish the things that we do. So again, um, I just want to make you feel like as you're starting your program and as you're um, you know, building your, your um, youth that you play such a key and an important role. Okay, so I really like this slide. Um, if you take a look at it, um, it was a study that was done, and it showed the difference between youth that had had a mentor and then youth that did not have a mentor. And as you can see, again, those, those five strategies that we saw through the Search Institute, um, it just shows the difference that having a mentor, having an adult leader, having a coach, what that does for a youth. So let's take just a minute to just kind of look this over. I really want you to just kind of take this in because, again, I think this is so key and so important um, to, to what we do and to show that um, we as adults make a difference in, in their lives and our programming makes a difference in their lives. Okay, so this slide is really key. Um, and it was actually, if any of you were at our December 5th um, summit, um, this, this was a slide taken from one of the presenters, actually. So what it's showing is that youth-led is not just adults getting out of the way, right? We know this. So it's not just adults totally sitting back, letting the youth run the show, because that can get kind of chaotic and that can get kind of crazy. They need us to be a really strong guide. Um, you know, you still, like Christy was saying with the youth voice, you still want to have their voice. You still want them to be the planners. They, you still want it to be fruitful and their ideas, but it's getting them to think about, think through their ideas. Is this really going to work? Do we have enough time to complete this? And I'll talk more later, but our youth have actually worked really hard on a strategic plan this year um, to kind of help plan out their year. And um, one of the things that we had to um, kept mentioning keep mentioning to them because we only meet once a month is that, you know, this is a great activity, this is wonderful, um, you know, but what are the resources that you need? And do we have enough time to complete this because we only meet once a month? And things like that. Um, so it's really important to, to remember that because I think a lot of adults in youth led prevention think, well, we just have to get out of their way of everything the youth want and just let them do everything. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, we really want to be strong partners with our youth because we need to be garnering what they're doing and, and building those skills. So again, it's very much a balance. Um, and, and I like this slide because it has that kind of balancing act. So, you know, it's um, a balance of the adults stepping back when they need to step back and let, letting the youth talk and not taking too much control, but it's also letting the youth step forward and feeling like they can have a voice. And again, it's asking those sort of um, facilitating questions and making sure that they're staying on track with what they said they're going to do. So again, this is just another great visual for that. Um, so you know, you see at the top it says the stepping forward, and then it's again that balancing. So what we're trying to do as adults is we're trying to create space and structure. We're trying to build their capacity. We're trying to encourage participation, support their voice, and provide resources. Right? That's what that's what we're doing. And so again, you constantly, as an adult, um, have to check yourself. And if you need resources for that, there's um, two great resources that we have here at Drug Free Act Clients that we found that you can look at yourself as an adult leader and evaluate how you interact with your youth. And then there's also a community 
or an organization checklist, you can evaluate is your organization on board with your youth? Um, are they doing what they need to be doing to garner that, that youth-led programming? Um, so this is, again, a really important slide and really important for us to think about. And I just encourage you to constantly be thinking, um, no, no adult is perfect at this, right? I mean, and sometimes your kids have to check you. Um, I know our, our youth council kids will sometimes at the end of the meeting, we have an evaluation, and sometimes we'll say, this meeting was not youth-led. And then um, my adult co-facilitator co co and I um, have to talk about that and say, you know, did we let the youth have their voice? Did we help to have them plan? Um, you know, so it's constantly you're thinking through these things. You're balancing. Um, you're checking in with your youth. Um, again, those checklists that I just talked about, those are incredibly important. Um, and you don't want to get too comfortable and say, well, the kids have it. You know, they don't need me anymore. Um, because, again, it's about building those skills. And you're constantly, um, you know, at least if you're working with high school programming, you're constantly getting new kids, right? So, um, again, constantly checking that um, and, and just making sure that you're being that good adult leader or good adult facilitator. Okay. So in thinking about youth-adult partnerships, um, again, and this just goes right back to that visual, um, adults are willing to share their power and responsibility with young people. I think this is so important um, because, again, it's, we, don't want, we don't want to be the ones that are getting all the glory. We, we want our kids to get the glory. Um, you know, but again, it's about being that good facilitator, asking those good questions. Um, and Mary and Christy will provide some amazing insight to um, kind of what their experiences have been with this in their program. So what is the adult role? We've got some cool graphics popping in. I like some graphics. Um, so, you know, it's, it's being that partner or being an ally, um, fostering, fostering equal involvement. Again, we're partners with our youth. We're not doing this for our youth. We're doing it with our youth. And that's incredibly important to remember. And I know we're being repetitive, but, but it's just to show how important that piece is. Um, and then you constantly want to document and evaluate. Like I said, we evaluate every single meeting that we have with our kids because we want to know what's working for them, what's going well for them, what can we do better, how can we build their skills better, um, things like that. So I think you know that is incredibly important. And then also, um, you know, as you're moving forward, um, you know, we're not going to be around forever, right? So we want to make sure that we're documenting all of our processes and all the things that we're going through, all the activities that we're doing. Because if we don't, and then we end up leaving or something ends up happening, then there's nothing to leave behind, and there's no legacy, and then it's a constant um, spinning our wheels. Um, and so that's something we want to try to avoid as the adult leaders. Also, oftentimes, and I've, I will admit I've had this issue too, sometimes you, you just say, well, they can't handle that, or, or this is what they can handle. We put them in a box, right? Um, but again, we're working on our strategic plan, um, and I was really scared at first, I'll be completely honest, because strategic planning and logic models, to me, it sounds high level and, and big idea. So I wasn't sure how it would go with our kids, but it was a really um, give and take sort of process. And you don't want to put them in that box. You don't want to make them feel like this is all they can do. Um, you, know, you really want to be that adult that um, you know, breaks it down for them, gives them the tools, gives them the support, um, you know, all of those things. So I, I really think that point um, on the first point there, the set aside preconceived notions of your youth is, is so important um, because it is. And it, again, it's something that we constantly have to check ourselves with. Um, you know, involving youth from the beginning. Again, we're not doing programming for the youth, and we want to make sure that whatever activity or thing that we're doing, that they're involved from the start. Um, you know, from you know what what kind of do if it's a pizza party, what kind of napkins, plates, you know, what kind of pizza do we need? You know, like things like that, and then all the way to to the end. Again, the evaluation piece of how did that go? What could we have done better? Or what did we do really well? Um, so I really um, think this, this slide is, is very important and key for us to think about as we're moving forward in our program. Also, I think, and again, this is a constant, 
um, having to check ourselves sort of thing, but we want to involve a diverse group of youth, not just the people that we know that are going to be really good leaders, because um, that's easy to do, right? Because you're like, well, that, those, those youth, are, they've got it, they understand it, um, they're going to do a great job, and I know they will. But, you know, to build, build our programs up and build our youth skills, we need to make sure we're including all of our youth. You know, if there's a youth in the corner that's, you know, just kind of sitting there and being quiet, asking them, hey, what do you think? Or after the meeting, um, you know, asking them, what did you think of the meeting? And, you know, what do you want to see for next time? Um, so I think that's incredibly important to remember. Um, also, just dedicating the time. You know, again, um, Youth-led youth programming is not an eight to five, right? I mean, um, they might text us. On, I, we have a group me app that we interact with our youth on, and, and they're texting at 11 o'clock at night. I try not to respond at 11 o'clock at night, but it happens. Um, but, you know, just, just being there and making sure they get the support, keeping them on track also I think is important because as, as youth, they're so incredibly busy, right? They've got 10 million things going on. So just, you know, reminding them, hey, did you get that um, – that project done, or did you get that flyer completed? Um, you know, just so you know, they know that you're checking in on them and that you're supporting them in what they're doing. You're not being forceful, like, hey, you need to do this, but you're just kind of checking with them and making sure it's going well. Um, so that's really important, too. And this goes back to um, how do you get your youth to participate? And I know we just had a meeting um, this past Tuesday with our coalitions that are thinking about starting youth-led groups. And they were really interested in um, you know, how do we motivate our youth to, to get involved and to participate. And I really think this, this, this WIIFM is what's in it for me. You have to think about it from their perspective. I know our kids will always tell you, um, hey, food, food will sell you on anything. So, you know, food, you know, what day do you want to have your meeting? You know, if there's a, a ton of sporting events on a Tuesday evening and you're having um, your meetings on a Tuesday evening, is that really realistic? Um, so we really have to be flexible with our youth um, and make sure that, that we're, we're on their level and meeting their needs. Um, obviously, being energetic is so important. They're going to know. When you're, when you're fearful or when you're not hyped up, they're going to know, and they're going to walk all over that. So it's important that you're, you're energetic, that you're engaged, and that you're supportive of what they're doing, that you're listening. Um, and, and I think to um, be, always be checking yourself again. Like be aware of how you're coming off to your youth. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times we'll, we'll have favorites in our groups, right, and we'll kind of gravitate toward them. So, again, um, and I know I'm being repetitive, it's probably annoying, but checking yourself. So that's, again, a, a time you want to check yourself. We don't want to per have perceived favorites because that's going to make want to make some of our youth not want to be involved, not want to be engaged, um, things like that. So I'm going to go ahead and see if, if we can get Mary back on with us. So um, I really appreciate everyone's patience, and we'll go back to those C-STOP strategies. Um, just give me a second here to see if we can get Mary back on the line. Mary, can you hear me? Mary. Hello. There she is. Okay. Hello? Yes. We can hear can you. you. Well, okay, good. I just muted and unmuted myself, and that seemed to fix it. I don't know what happened. But anyway, we apologize for that. Um, I'm really uh, excited to be part of this today, and um, I'm really excited about the upcoming academies that we're going to have, too. Um, Sarah, are you going to go back to the uh, CSAP strategies then? Yep, I'm heading back. Okay, one second and we'll uh, get back to where I was supposed to kick in. Okay, you should be good, okay. Mary. Okay, 
So, um, you know, you've heard Sarah talk about the strategic planning process a little bit, and if you come to our academies, that's one of the things that you will learn about more in detail if you're not familiar with it, and that's the process that really is um, going to help you to make sure that whatever programming your youth-led uh, program is doing, that it's going to be effective, and it involves using data and selecting, you know, the behaviors or the, the uh, problems that you want to try to work on. And then once you do that, you need to have strategies that you're going to use to accomplish the outcomes that you're striving for. And so um, the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention has uh, six strategies that have really been shown to be effective in doing this, and five of them can be used in youth-led programming. And so, as you see here, it's information dissemination, education, alternatives, environmental strategies, and community-based processes. And so I'll go through and try to explain each one of those a little bit more in detail. Um, the first one is information dissemination. And this one really focuses on helping people to become more aware of certain issues and problems that uh, are faced with our youth or in our communities. And it also includes doing that through getting information out there, not only about the problem itself, but about what services may be available to help with those things. One of the key um, aspects of this is that it's one-way communication. So you're really just, you're putting the information out there, um, but there's no opportunity for the recipients to really uh, converse with you or your agency or your, uh, you know, your youth directly. So it's things like brochures, media campaigns, public service announcements, health fairs, having assemblies, information booths, and those types of things um, that will help um, get that information out there and make people more aware of what's going on in their school and community, but also um, how those things can be helped with the services that are available. And then the next one is education. And while it is similar, um, in some aspects to information dissemination, what distinguishes it is this is an opportunity to have two-way communication between uh, presenters and an audience in which you're getting out information. So it's um, getting information out to that audience um, about the things that you're working on or the issues that you're trying to address and giving them a chance to respond back, ask questions, learn um, about skills that they may need, decision-making abilities, and things like that, they're going to help with whatever issue you're targeting. And so it can be things like classroom and large group presentations, uh, conferences um, in substance abuse prevention um, and leadership. We have things like Youth to Youth and Ohio Teen Institute. But there are other things as well with different um, other types of problems that you may be addressing with your youth-led programming. It's uh, skill-focused training, and, it, and it's opportunities to use skills that your youth have been taught, and they then can present those to adults, to other youth, and even to younger kids. And then our next strategy is alternatives. Um, this is uh, one of the ones that the kids obviously love because it's really about having fun in a healthy way. So without any type of high-risk behavior, including alcohol or drug use. And there can be a myriad of things that the kids can help plan. You know, you really need their input as to what they think is fun um, and what they think their peers uh, is going to think is fun. So it can include things like drug-free dances, fun events, lock-ins, and there's many more things that could go under that category as well. And then environmental approaches, this is really important because, um, you know, we can, can help our youth and give them skills, 
But if they go back out into a school or community that's been unchanged, it's going to be very difficult for them to retain those new skills and, and continue to make those good choices. And so uh, this is a, a way that your programming can influence um, policies and standards that exist in your school or your community. Um, and you know, with the, with the goal of obviously improving those issues so that there's, um, you know, more positive behaviors, more positive health going on. And so any kind of social norming campaign, um, you know, so often kids think that everyone's doing it, whether it comes to sexual activity, alcohol and drug use, and, and those types of things. And we really need to do some social norming uh, campaigns with them to help them to realize that that's many, many times not the case, that the majority of kids are making good decisions. It can include things like addressing uh, uh, advertising for alcohol, cigarettes, other things like that to youth. Um, it can include compliance checks to make sure that uh, local agencies that sell alcohol are checking IDs. And it can be other things that are going to address the conditions in the school or community to try to improve them to, again, make them uh, a healthier environment for our kids to be in. And then the last one is community-based processes. And this focuses on providing prevention services um, in the community that include uh, organizing, training, planning, um, agencies in the community cooperating together in coalitions, and networking. And with all of these strategies, it's really important. You don't want to just choose one or the other. For example, if you just have information dis dissemination and alternative activities, without including education and environmental strategies to, um, you're probably not going to get the outcomes that you want. And so the best uh, plan includes um, all of these strategies. And so um, with the community-based processes, it can be, again, things like having a youth advisory board for your program, doing fundraising out in the community that makes people aware of what you're doing as part of that process, public service announcements, getting out there and doing some community service, having a town hall meeting, um, having a meeting between schools and community um, agencies, having coalitions that involve partnerships between schools and community agencies in your community. All of these things um, would fall under community-based processes. And um, I'm turning it back over to, uh, is it Christy next? No, it's actually me, Mary. OK, <laughs> sorry. Back to me again. I'm going to click through these slides again. You know, just as review. That's what we're trying to do. That was really our goal. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk about the Ohio Youth-Led Prevention Network now and what we do. Um, and then we're going to each kind of go through our programs and talk about um, the different applied skills and things like that. So hopefully this piece will really benefit you. Um, so take some good notes, uh, whatever you need to do. Um, because I think that's, that's the biggest part about creating a youth-led program is, is having other ideas and other people to, to bounce ideas off of. And that's what we as the Ohio Youth Prevention Network want to do. We want to be the connection um, to all of your groups to provide those resources, to provide the training. Um, things like that. So don't hesitate to, to reach out with reach out to us <clears throat> as you're developing your program. Um, so again, my name is Sarah Malik, and I'm the program manager for the Ohio Youth Led Prevention Network. And just to give you a little background on the Ohio Youth Led Prevention Network, it was actually um, a few years ago. Um, the Department of Ohio Mental Health and Addiction Services, which is our funders. Um, reach out to Drug Free Action Alliance, <clears throat> apologize for the cough, um, and, what, and said, um, you know, we really want to do something around youth-led programming. What can we do? Um, and so we end up getting um, grant money to, to support that. So basically we developed a plan for them that we wanted to provide training, we wanted to provide resources, we wanted to connect the groups across Ohio um, that were doing 
great youth lab's work and provide support um, and evidence-based strategies, things that they could take. And again, like Mary mentioned, these academies that are coming up that I'll talk more about um, are so incredibly important for, for building those skills and for building that knowledge. So I really recommend, if you haven't registered for that already, to, to really consider registering for that. So the Ohio Youth Lab Prevention Network, when we first started, um, we reached out to our two biggest partners, which um, Mary mentioned. Ohio Teen Institute and Youth to Youth. So these are two of the longest standing programs in Ohio, um, and they really serve the largest youth population, and they have their own local groups. But they probably serve um, you know, around 300 youth in total um, in their larger groups. They have a big conference every year um, where they get all the youth together, do some training, um, things like that. So we really reached out to them first to kind of be the first people to kind of help support what we were trying to do. Um, and now we've expanded. We have um, about 200 groups in total that we're connected to um, that you know asked for our assistance um, that are a part of our adult council, that are a part of our youth council, which I'll talk more about. So again, Ohio Youth and Prevention Network is formed to really connect all of the groups across Ohio. Um, again, there was so much great work around youth-led programming, but we weren't able to document that. We weren't able to show it. And we we and, and, and youth-led prevention, I think we constantly are trying to prove ourselves of like the great work that we're doing, and people um, you know, sometimes don't always see that. So I think having this statewide connection to show these are what all the groups are doing, and this is the work that we're doing, and this is the support we have in Ohio, um, shows what a force we are. And um, as we're starting to gain more recognition, um, other states are looking to us um, to, to do some of this some of this similar programming. So I really commend um, all of the Ohio youth-led programs for the work that they're doing. Um, so also a little bit about um, the, the people that we work with. So we have an adult council and a youth council. And because they're in the community and they have um, you know, community, school, agency-based groups, we really look to them um, to kind of push out what we're trying to do. So push out any resources or trainings or things that we have going on, like Mary and Christy. They're both on the adult council um, and they're helping to present today. Um, we have developed with our adult council a logic model and a strategic plan, which I will send out after the webinar so that you can kind of look that over. Um, but they've spent the past two years working really hard on that. What is Ohio's need? Um, you know, what do we need to be focused on? What does the data say? Um, so they've been incredible partners um, on, on pushing that forward. And then the youth council functions functions very similarly. And I'll talk about, I'm sure most of you have heard about our big We Are the Majority rally, and the youth came up with that. And then this year, they're really working hard on their strategic plan like I've talked about. So um, we've taken them. We, we had a big training retreat. Um, they're trying to expand their, their messaging beyond substance abuse prevention um, to include more groups. So you know, using mental health awareness. Um, we have a student that um, you know, wants to, wants to promote bullying awareness and things like that. Um, so we're really trying to be more inclusive, and our youth is really good about keeping us in check with that. So our guiding statement, and this comes directly from our logic model, um, and this is what our youth use to create our We Are the Majority campaign. So it says the majority of youth aged 12 to 12 through 17 Ohio do not report substance use, physical violence, and mental health issues. The Ohio Youth Life Prevention Network is dedicated to promote, protecting and promoting the well-being of Ohio's youth. So this is what we use, again, to guide our logic model and to guide our strategic plan. Um, and this comes from the data, the Monitoring the Future and the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, most importantly. So again, we took this, used it as our logic model and strategic plan. Our youth looked at it. And this is where they came up with the We Are the Majority campaign. And I want to spend some time talking about that because we're really proud of this, camp, this social norming campaign that our youth came up with. So again, they looked at the data. They took the data. We were in our first year, and the youth said, we want to do something for Ohio that's big, that's bold, that shows that youth aren't making really bad choices like TV and media and everyone wants everyone to believe about youth that youth are making good, healthy, positive choices um, despite what most think. So um, you know, we know a majority of youth um, are making good choices when it comes to, to substance use. We know um, a majority of youth um, are promoting good mental health wellness. 
Um, we know a majority of youth aren't bullying. Um, so these positive, positive messaging. So our first year, um, we had 400 students, and they did a march to the State House just to kind of show the senators, the legislators, um, all of the important people that, hey, Ohio's, Ohio's youth are here, and we're here to take a stand that, that um, we're making good choices. And so um, it was a really successful campaign. So the next year, we tried it again, um, did it a little differently, again, a march to the State House, um, and had about 1,200. And then last year was our biggest, most successful rally. We had 2,000 youth at our rally. And last year we were able to bring in a celebrity. Um, and, and again, the youth did all of the planning for this and all the preparation. And they wrote the letter to the celebrity. We had Mario um, Barrett, who um, was popular in the early 2000s. He has a, a foundation called the Mario Do Right Foundation, which works with youth that have grown up in homes of substance use. Um, so he came in, um, and that just that was like that cool factor for the kids. Like not only is it, is our youth standing up and making positive choices, but we've had a celebrity connected with us, um, and we had several senators and legislators um, come and speak. Um, and then there was a private meeting with the governor that the youth had. Um, so it really just shows that the capabilities of our youth across Ohio, right? I mean, they're just doing such amazing things. And I just get so excited when I talk about it um, because it's, it's just so amazing. So this year, um, we have a, a new partner, um, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. So this, these are students that have been through the system. And so we're working with them. We're going to do a resiliency ring along with our rally at the State House um, to show support for those that are struggling with mental illness and to bring some awareness around that. So we're still going to have the We Are the Majority mes messaging. Um, and then it's going to be here at Clipper Stadium um, at Huntington Park. And um, it's just going to be a fantastic day. We have um, another celebrity coming. I can't release that information quite yet. Um, but it's going to be just a, another great day for Ohio's youth to showcase the wonderful things that they're doing. So to kind of go back, um, we, we've looked at the Ohio Flood Prevention Network since the start, and how can we make it better? How can we make it more effective? So we've worked with Dr. Holly Raffle, um, who is a professor at um, Ohio University's Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs. And she's just a phenomenal, phenomenal asset to our program. Um, and she's helped us really develop um, this logic model and strategic plan of what we need. She went out into the community and surveyed um, youth-led groups that were already in existence on what we need better, what kind of resources, what kind of tools do we need. Um, so she's just been a fantastic resource for us in, in our development of our logic model and strategic plan. So basically what we did with our logic model and our strategic plan is um, we wanted to develop this theory of change and to provide Ohio with a plan, with goals, um, and things that you can use in your communities. You can take the strategic plan and apply it to what you're doing. And again, like Mary said, those academies are really going to help you develop those skills um, to, to take that back to your community. So it's not just about getting the paper, right? I mean, you really have to understand the steps that are taken, and it is a lot, and it's involved. But um, you know, don't get bogged down by that. You know, when I send it out and, and you see it, um, you know, really, once you start taking the steps, it really starts to flow together. And again, those academies are really going to help with that. So with the strategic plan, um, again, we're trying to provide leadership infrastructure. Um, the the background behind what we do. So the why behind the youth led programming. Um, and we want to just make sure that everything that we're doing in Ohio is effective and evidence-based. Christy talked about those scare tactics. We know that doesn't work. Um, a lot of people like to use those to get a reaction. Um, but you know, when you look at the research and you look at the science, those things just don't work. So it's about doing what works and also, again, what's going to be a buy-in for our youth. What are they going to speak to? Um, so having those focus groups, you know, things like that. So what we're working on this year, again, I've talked a lot about our Youth Council strategic plan um, and breaking that down. And you'll get to actually see our youth um, in a video if you come to the academies going through that process. Um, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but you know, we really had to break it down for our youth. Again, we couldn't use those adult words. We had to just say, what are your goals for the year? How are you going to accomplish your goals? Um, you know, what does the data say? Is this something you want to focus on? Um, things like that. So that's been a really key thing that we've been trying to work on this year. We're also trying to 
um, form more partnerships with our with our Ohio group. So we've got um, the human op communities, which um, primarily work with my, minority youth. Youth, and I was just at their conference um, a couple weeks ago, um, and so trying to work more with them and be more inclusive of their messaging too. And then again, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the Ohio chapter, um, working with them on um, you know how can we we bridge um, the prevention to the recovery, um, and what does that look like? So. Those are some things that we're trying to work on. Um, we also are working really hard on a statewide youth led directory. Um, so this would include all of the programs of across Ohio. So right now, currently, again, we probably have around 200 contacts divided by county, um, things like that. And if you're interested um, in being on that directory, um, feel free to email me after the webinar. We would love to put you on for your county, or if you want to make sure that you're on the directory for your county, feel free to contact. Um, and then again, these um, adult leader training academies that, that Mary has been talking about, which is so great, Mary, that you led right into this. Um, so here's just a little bit of information on that. So again, we're working with Dr. Holly Raffel. Um, there is some research, some science on the Holden model, and it's a theory on, on youth-led programming. So what we're doing um, in Ohio is we're, we're working through this theory and using it as um, the catalyst or the thing, the why behind what we're doing. So Mary, Christy, and myself have um, been kind of the test pilot group for this messaging. So um, when you come to these academies, there's going to be some pre-worksheets to kind of think through your program. So the first one is is thinking um, thinking through the more concepts of your program. So you know how your program got started, or if you're new, um, you know what do you want your program to look like? What do you want your youth to be working on? And then the second part of the academies is more the evaluation piece. So what outcomes are you looking for? Um, things like that. So again, I know I'm stressing it a lot, but these academies are so important, and we're so fortunate to have gotten the grant funding to support these because I think it's really what Ohio's group, youth-led groups need, um, you know, to continue receiving funding to, um, you know, build more partnerships. Um, and it's going to be great for networking, too. There's going to be a lot of other groups there. Mary, my, Mary Christie, myself, and I are, are going to be at some of the academies. So feel free to come up to us, you know, talk with us. Um, we're happy to help in whatever way we can. Um, one last thing I want to talk about before I turn it over to Christy um, so she can talk about her group is the importance of social media. Um, and we really spent a lot of time looking at this. We have an Instagram, a Twitter, two Facebook accounts, a YouTube account, a Pinterest. So we just are all about the social media um, because I think, you know, when we're doing this messaging, um, connecting with other groups. I, I found connections in California and um, Puerto Rico and, and, and all, all over the place because of our social media presence. Um, so these are just some statistics just to think about. So when you're starting your youth-led group, um, you know, working with them on that social media presence because that's kind of where our world is right now um, and, and making sure that you're including that in, in whatever you're doing. So our two hashtags that we have that have been um, fairly successful. One one we've had for a while and one we're just starting. But we've got hashtag be the majority for the we are the majority messaging. And then we've got hashtag be aware. And this is a new one that our youth have developed this year because they really want to raise awareness on um, mental health and, and any other messaging. So any positive messaging that they can include um, that includes youth, that's kind of what we do. Hashtag be aware. Um, so so being aware, raising awareness that youth are making good, healthy, positive choices. So that's our more general one. Um, the kids have just kind of started doing that. Um, and, and so, so far it seems to be going well. So um, again, just something to consider as you're moving your groups forward. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Christy, um, and she's going to talk about her group. So Christy, are you with us? I'm here. Thanks, Sarah. That was great information. So let me give you a little background on where I come from. I am with originally with an agency. I spent um, I'm one with Envision Partnerships for 12 years, and I'm currently the project coordinator for a local coalition. So when I first came on, um, youth development was probably one of the um, main hats that I wore. And we were putting together a town hall meeting, which to reference back to Mary, CSAP strategies falls under that community-based processes. 
And after we did the town hall meeting, probably three or four years, the adults kind of looked around at each other and said, why aren't there any youth at this table? And why aren't the adults leading this town hall meeting? So it was kind of given to me as, will you go out and collect some youth and have these youth present the opening remarks at the town hall meeting and then work in the small groups to develop environmental strategies for each school district. So even though I work with an agency, I have some connectivity to the schools in my county. So I had this big task, and I wasn't really sure how I was going to collect students. And for me, the thing that still drives my students to come to the table, and this might sound silly or funny, but our volunteer hours. I go out and I say, do you need volunteer hours for your civics class, for your AP history class, for National Honor Society, or do you need letters of recommendation? And that's really how I, I begin recruiting my kids, getting my kids to the table. Now, that being said, there are some other tricks that I've learned being an agency and not connected to the schools. And kind of these are the tips that I've used, and I hope that they can be helpful for you also. So a couple of months ago, when school had been in for a, a month or two, um, there was a, a large population of students that was very diverse that were suspended as a result of marijuana. And when the parents came in, the parents said, well, it's just marijuana. What's the big deal? So this kind of disturbing or significant event that occurred in our community really kind of spearheaded an offshoot of my town hall meeting group. And they said, really, we want to look at you know, why, wh how many parents are actually saying this? How many parents are actually promoting this idea? And, and what can we do to counter promote that? So that kind of um, created a, a separate branch of my group. Um, you know, it's at the beginning of the school year. You can always go into schools and, and, and talk about, you know, do we want to start something off? Is there new information that just came out? Maybe it's prize data. Maybe it's um, information from a local group. Um, you know, maybe there's some surveys or some focus groups. You know, are there youth in your community that, you know, want to do something? They're spearheading and they're looking for some connection with an adult. You know, are there threats to the community? Is there a significant issue specifically concerning your youth that needs to be confronted? So these are all kind of um, little things that can kind of, you can kind of build that foundation off of. And I wanted to kind of speak back to some things that Sarah said. So in addition to my letters of recommendation and my volunteer hours, Sarah's absolutely right. Food is a huge motivator. Um, and I always have to have food there. Um, because they are hungry, hungry little hippos, as I like to joke with them. But they're always like, hey, Christy, what are you going to have? What are we going to do? Um, but they also like to be visual, which kind of speaks back to what Sarah was saying about social media. So um, I give them the opportunity to stand up in front of 100 to 200 um, youth, peers, uh, community members. I give them the opportunity to you know, film um, we're going to film a, a like music video to see his new Elastic Heart song with kind of an emphasis on mental health. Um, I give them the power to control social media, even though I'm kind of in the background monitoring what they post. Um, so, you know, in addition to food and t-shirts and letters of recommendation and volunteer hours, that spotlight is really important, too. And to go back to what Sarah says, we do our meetings on Sunday. Um, because I'm an agency, I'm not school-based, I found that kids are really super busy, and, that, and that's the day that they really have a little bit of free time. And so we meet on Sundays anywhere from noon to 6. Um, you know, sometimes we meet the whole time, sometimes we meet for 30 minutes, sometimes we meet for an hour. Um, so, you know, just a reference back to what Sarah says, that flexibility in, in meeting kids where they're at is really important. So we really want to build on that momentum. So we go back to those bullets, we want to make sure that, um, you know, we pull something that that community has and that we can get our foot in the door, that we can attract members. Um, and we really want to pull out a call to action. You know, I will hang flyers if I have permission at schools. I'll go to, you know, Starbucks. I'll go to Panera. I'll go to the movie theater. Um, I'll ask some, some of my schools to put it on social media. I'll ask some of our local, uh, you know, events in our local restaurants and things to put it on social media. Um, and, and those are kind of the ways that I get it out. You know, I might only get one or two. Um, but that's one or, or two more than I had before. So after I kind of build that momentum, um, I'm always trying to get feedback. You know, I, under the, the grants, have very specific things that I need to address or accomplish, but those might not be important to the youth in my community. So I'm always asking, you know, is this something that you think 
applies to your school or applies to your peers or applies to your community. And if it's not, how do we work around it? What does it have to look like? What does it have to sound like? Um, you know, what are you willing to commit? You know, just like Sarah said, I have students who may not want to be in that spotlight. They want to be a part of it. They want to take pictures before and after. They don't necessarily want to give the presentation. So they'll do the PowerPoint, or they'll run the technology, or they'll be my communication director, where they'll send out text messages or emails, although they don't really use email all that much, or put out the social media. Um, so there's really a, a, a way to get them committed and connected on all levels. And is it something you believe in? And if it's not something you believe in, they're probably not going engage to engage in it. So you know, how do we find that something? Um, you know, as we've developed this town hall meeting, our focus originally was alcohol. So we did one event, and that was a town hall meeting for prom and graduation. And we had the schools come together, and we talked about how do we have a safe prom and grad season. And after we did that six or seven years, the students were like, OK, Christy, I got this. We're good. We can do this. Let's add other parts to it. And then after adding parts to the town hall meeting, they're like, well, what if we did this? Or what if we did that? So it started this one major event that we were planning for. And as we kind of got good at it, and as we kind of you know, built that foundation, the kids really wanted to do other things. You know, They wanted the social media campaign. They wanted to um, go into the elementary schools. They wanted to um, do different things at the local cafe. They wanted to do trash pickups, all different sorts of things that kind of go back to what Mary says. Well, falls under those CSAP strategies, those environmental approaches, those alternative activities, those education and information dissemination, all of those things. And so with my next slide, I just talk about recruit, 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 um, which I kind of already talked about. So assemblies at churches, at, you know, at schools, um, you know, we did some Pandora, we can do some Pandora ads, we can do some TV stuff, we can do some social media stuff. And I say here on the slide, one student champion, and that is really powerful, but you can also have one teacher or one parent or one community champion and that person is really going to open those doors and you know help you with that connectivity. I really started with the daughter of a coworker and built off of that. Um, and even though I'm not at a school, I do see kind of the same you know turnover with kids. We have kids that graduate, move on to college. Um, but just that one kid kind of let me into the school, let me into the church, let me into the community center. Um, and then they brought along a friend, and that friend brought along a friend. And those, as those friends kind of graduated, there were still some younger friends or some younger family members, and we kind of worked off of that. Um, and that's kind of how we kind of pushed and built and grew. And now we have a, a drama section of it. We have a, um, a panel that goes out and speaks at um, you know, local community events. We have a behind-the-scene group that kind of puts together all of the little details, you know, if we're getting t-shirts or if we're getting food or if we're getting um, speakers to come in or education or things like that. So when we started, we really just had one event. That's all we were focusing on was building towards that one event. And after, uh, you know, a couple of years, we grew from that. So it's really, it's not impossible to just start really simple and work your way from that. And you know, my next slide just kind of talks about how you have to remember that, I kind of referenced this in the beginning, you really, really want to define your goals. You really want to make sure that you can articulate what it is you want. You know, I just, I, I want a youth coalition. I need a youth coalition. Okay, what are they going to do? What are they going to sound like? You know, and, and bringing one or two youth on in the beginning and kind of shaping that is so important. Um, and, you know, writing it down, having it visual. And the better organized you are, the more successful you're going to be. And, and that goes with the students, too. The more organized they are, too, the more successful they're going to be. And I think you know, my, my last part is that you, just, you really have to be flexible with the kids. You really have to engage with the kids. Um, and you have to think of them as resources. And they can be all different sorts of resources. And Sarah and Mary spoke about this. You know, they can be technology resources. They can be education resources. I always joke with my kids that they educate me probably more than I give them any education. Um, you have to kind of be in touch with what's kind of current in their world. Um, and you have to give them a large portion of the planning and decision making. You know, I try to sit back as much as possible, which is kind of difficult for me, and let them plan it and then come back and say, okay, is this really feasible in the time that we have? If we had to prioritize, what would be the most important? What are the two most important things? Um, you know, do we have the resources for you? Do you really see your community picking this up and, and, and really engaging this? Um, so still giving them 
that that decision making and that planning, but kind of you know gauging that and and, and um, you know guiding that process and making sure that they have hands on work. Uh, you know, to speak to what Sarah said, I always feel like I'm overburdening them or asking them too much. In the other last meeting, I said, do you want to do the PowerPoint? presentation through email, do you want me to do it, and then you guys go back through and edit it and pull and add. And one of the young persons said, Christy, we would just like to sit here and do it together. Um, and so we did. We just sat down and we worked on it together and we had a great time and, and it gave us um, you know, the ability to really engage and share ideas. And I, I was worried I would ask too much of their time, but they stayed for a long time. And we want to make sure their roles and their rules are clearly defined. So, you know, do you have, what's the structure of your group? Do you have a president? Do you have a vice president? Do you, you know, what are their expectations? How often do they have to come? Um, you know, what do they have to give um, outside of the meetings? You know, are we requ requiring transportation, things like that? And making sure up front that they know that, that they know that, you know, they can miss a meeting. Um, or maybe they have to attend all of their meetings. Um, so making sure, like I said, those rules and those roles are, are clearly defined and, and they have it somewhere in their hand that they can reference back to or you know, through email or through social media. They know this is what I agree to um, and this is what my expectations are. And they can hold each other accountable for that too. Um, so I don't necessarily have to be the bad guy. Um, they can say, listen, hey, you said that you were going to do this. You know, we all agree this was the plan. You know, let's make sure that we follow through. And they can hold each other accountable and make sure that you know they all feel like they're team players. Um, and then my last slide just talks about how it's so important to celebrate and have fun. And I know you guys are, are all really good at this. You know, we really start the beginning of each group doing a funny activity, a funny get to know you, um, icebreaker, there's music. Um, we may have a five minute dance party that I've made sure that they promise not to videotape and share at a later point in time. Um, but just being goofy and silly and then checking in, you know, how you doing, what's going on, what's new, remembering those little details, you know, how's your brother doing, how's your friend doing, how's college applying going. And, you know, once we do complete our big task, you know, whether it's the town hall, whether it's the video, then we celebrate, we have fun, we have a meeting that, you know, the agenda is really loose and, you know, we just be goofy and we be silly. And in the summer we spend a day out at a camp and we do the high and, ropes, high and low ropes course. Um, you know, we do we do some of dancing because we're dance fools. Um, we do just some social time, some get to know you time. We'll watch a movie outside. Um, so balancing that hard work and that you know those, those great community goals that we have that we want to check off and achieve with just some time where we can connect and be silly and have fun um, and feel like you know we're a team and we know each other and we feel comfortable with each other and it's not just all you know, nose to the grind, work, 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 work. And those are really tips that have helped me. And, you know, hopefully we'll have some time at the end that we can do some back and forth questioning or feel free to email me at any time or call me and I would love to share ideas and get some feedback from you guys too. So that's the agency perspective and I'm going to hand it off to Mary to kind of give you the school perspective. Um, there's a, that was a lot of great information, Christy. And um, there's a lot of similarities between doing youth-led programming in an agency setting and doing it in a school setting, um, but there's also some differences. And um, so I'm going to kind of focus on that. Um, I have been doing youth-led prevention uh, in a school system for 32 years. I've had different positions within the school as I've done that, but I've, I've done the youth-led uh, programming pretty much throughout my entire career. Um, and so just some tips that I have um, for you if you're working in a school setting. First of all, you want to make sure that you're going to have the support of your administration. Um, that's going to be key in, in being able to carry out projects in your school um, and in the community that um, would publicize uh, the program through the school. Um, I, I added, you know, writing a proposal to have it be a paid supplemental position. And my goal in doing that and in, in, in including that is not so much the, the payment, um, 
although I think you know you deserve to have some compensation for all the effort that you're going to put into the program, but it's more about um, making sure that your youth-led program is recognized as an official program of the school along with all the sports and the other clubs, um, and that you have that support of the school system. And then, you know, you're going to need to uh, decide on some basic requirements for joining and participating in the program. Um, I would suggest holding an informational meeting for any interested students. And if you're starting out brand new, one of the things that you could do is to invite um, some students from another school that already has an established program or if there's um, a youth-led program in your county or your community that you know about, have those kids come and talk because what they say about what they're doing and you know how much they're getting out of the program they're involved in is going to have a lot more weight, obviously, with, with the kids than what you have to say. And I think that will hopefully motivate and inspire them to want to get involved at your school. Um, you're going to want to hand out, you know, what the program requirements are, what the meeting schedule for the year is, and if you're going to have applications, you would hand those out at that meeting. I think it's really important to um, let the kids know what the meeting dates are going to be for the whole year um, so that they can get that on their calendar and try to work around that with their other commitments because what I find is most of the kids involved are really busy in a lot of different things. Um, and then once you have your, your kids that are deciding to join at the beginning, you know, have a meeting with them. And then that's where some things may change because now you're getting their input into what they see as, you know, the purpose and the goals of the program, what they think the guidelines and requirements should be. And, and then you begin brainstorming with them what they want to accomplish, what their goals are, what projects do they actually want to work on. And, you know, so again, it's really important that it's youth-led and you're kind of the, uh, the rudder that's going to keep the, the ship on course, um, you know, making sure that they're doing things appropriately as they're working on, on their projects. You're sharing your knowledge and expertise with them, but, you know, they have to really have a lot of part in it, a lot of input in order for them to invest in it and take ownership of it, as we've talked about, all three of us have talked about today. Um, I borrowed from Youth to Youth, which is a, a great substance abuse uh, prevention program for youth, um, kind of a, a youth-friendly way of talking about um, a youth-led prevention program if you're really geared towards preventing substance abuse in youth. Um, that, that they understand that the goals are to get some accurate alcohol and drug information out there, to sponsor and include personal growth activities, and that would be for the members, but also for the other kids in the school. Um, having drug-free fun, that's the alternative strategy that we talked about with the CSAP strategies. Um, and again, that's for the members of your group and also for the other kids in the school or it can be for working with younger kids, too, having your high school students work with younger students. And then the environmental change. And that's where, you know, your strategic planning really comes into play, um, what your goals and outcomes are that you're going to try to achieve. And that's going to include um, some environmental strategies, changing, you know, some of the things that are in the school and the community, they're going to, uh, so that that will better promote healthy choices and healthy decisions for kids in all areas of their life. You want to you wanna get training, and if you're new, um, you need to get some training for yourself, and these two upcoming academies I think are going to be outstanding. Um, and so that would be a great way to do that. There's, of course, lots of trainings available for both adult and youth, depending upon what your group is focusing on, uh, what issues your group is focusing on. Um, two great conferences that we've already mentioned that the youth can go to are um, Ohio Teen Institute and Youth to Youth. Both of those are in the summer. And then, next slide, Sarah. Again, 
you know, this is youth-led prevention. So, you know, we need to make sure that everything we're doing, that the youth are the ones that are really giving input into what's, uh, what the group is going to work on. They are actually doing the work. Um, and you're there to make sure that everything kind of stays on course and, and just to steer them back in the right direction if they start to veer off. Obviously, publicity is a key piece. Um, I think continuing to make sure you have that administrative support, so invite them to one of your meetings and have the kids talk to them about what the group is doing. Um, I have found over and over again that that is so much more effective in getting administrative support than, you know, if I just go in and talk to my principal or whatever. Um, using social media to publicize your projects and, and programming, um, we've talked about that, but that's where the kids are. They're all about the social media and that's what they're going to pay attention to. Um, but you can use some of the older methods too in terms of having students write articles for your school or district newspaper, um, having them make um, public service announcements or videos for the morning announcements posters and flyers and things like that. They love to do all that kind of stuff. And when they are the ones doing it, it's going to appeal to the other, other kids in the school. Network. That's a huge thing because you learn so much by talking to other people in the field to see what they're doing, um, what ideas they have, suggestions they may have for challenges that you're facing that they may have also faced. Again, these upcoming academies are going to be a great way to network with um, youth-led prevent or youth-led programming uh, professionals from all over the state. And you know, I think um, you know if you're if you're planning on doing this for a while, it's always great to get new ideas. That's one of the challenges is is coming up with new things over and over again, and um, talking with other people and, and finding out what they're doing is a great way to do that. And then, obviously, we want to have the strongest, most effective youth-led programs that we can have. That's why I'm so excited about um, being part of the Ohio Youth-Led Prevention Network, because I believe that we're going to strengthen youth uh, programming throughout the state and make it as strong as and effective that, as it can be. But that involves using that strategic plan that we've talked about, which you'll learn more about at the academies. The strategic plan really involves having pre and post data, um, using the five youth-related CSAP strategies that we've talked about, and then evaluating your, your effort then to make sure that what you're doing is making a difference. And the kids can get really excited about that, too. They want to know that what they're doing is, is, is purposeful and that it really is um, you know, helping things to be better, that their efforts are worthwhile. And then kind of summarizing what makes successful youth-led programs. You obviously you know, need dedicated, passionate, and fun advisors. Um, I think I mentioned that I've been doing this for 32 years. and you know. That's a great way of saying that I'm getting old, but I've been doing this because I really believe that youth are so capable. I've seen the difference that it makes in their lives and that they can make in the surrounding school and community. Um, the young people need to be responsible, capable, and positive role models. You're emphasizing all the time to them the positive aspects of healthy behaviors in all areas of their lives. They need to be, um, you know, involved with every aspect of the of the program from the beginning all the way through everything that you do throughout the year. And it's really important that you allow the kids to be themselves and that they are appreciated for who they are. I think that in and of them that in and of itself makes a huge difference for the youth. Um, Christy mentioned, you know, really appreciating them and doing some celebrating of what they do. We have an end of the year banquet in our program where we showcase everything that we did for the year to parents, faculty, and some um, community members who are invited, but also where the students are recognized for what they've done during the year and the accomplishments that they've had during the program. And um, I think the youth really appreciate that. 
And at this point, um, I believe we're going to uh, unmute you and uh, give you guys a chance to ask questions about anything that we've talked about. Um, I also am always willing to uh, answer any questions via email or phone or whatever and help in any way that I can, but we're going to give you a chance to ask some questions right now. Okay, so I've opened it up to everybody. Um, sorry if there's some feedback. If there's a lot of feedback on yours, we just ask that you um, mute it so that we don't hear all the background. But anyone is free at this time to ask any questions of myself, Mary, or Christy. Um, or if you're more comfortable, you're welcome to type it in the question box, and I'll get to that. Um, so at this time, anyone who would like to, to speak is more than welcome to. I have a question. Go ahead. This is Rebecca Miller from Sida County. Uh -huh. um, could you give me a definition of scare tactics? Yeah, sure. Christy, Mary, do you want to take this or do you want me to take it? Well, I think, I think scare tactics are um, anything that, you know, is geared towards getting kids to really think about the dangers of whatever it is that you're talking about, whatever issue you're talking about. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that has, has very short-term effect on them, but many times it doesn't accomplish what we want it to at all. For example, early on in substance abuse prevention field, People would bring in recovering, uh, you know, alcoholics and drug addicts to speak to kids, thinking that they would take away from that, wow, you know, that person, you know, has been through so much and, you know, I don't want to have those things happen to me. I don't want to end up incarcerated or losing my family or whatever. But what they what they took away what they take away from it often is that person did all that stuff, drank and took drugs and stuff, and but now they're okay. So you know I can do that too, and all my life will be okay. Um, so it kind of you know it kind of backfired, or you know you you go in in uh, elementary classrooms and show them you know diseased lungs and. Uh, you know, rotten teeth and all of this when you're talking about the effects of use, uh, using tobacco. But then, you know, one of the kids will raise their hand and say, well, you know, my grandfather is 85 years old and he has smoked his whole life and he's still okay. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just um, things that we've found you know, through long-term, you know, studying what we're doing in the prevention field, that it's really not effective, and it, and it many times, if it has any effect of all, at all, it's very short-lived, or it may even backfire and do the opposite of what we're what we're wanting it to do, such as in the examples that I just gave. Yeah, I, mean, I think a lot of data to back that up. We actually have a document, like Christy mentioned, um, that goes into detail and explains um, why this doesn't work um, and things like that. So I will send a link to that. We, um, it is something that you can order through our website. So when I send you the follow-up to this webinar as it's being recorded and some of the other information I'll be sending, I'll be sure to send that link. So if you wanted to order um, some of that information um, to kind of get more background on it, um, we're more than happy to do that. Okay. Um, I have another question. Okay. Is, the, is this um, PowerPoint available to us? Yes, I will send the power once I once the um, webinar is over. Um, the, it, it's recording right now, so there will be a link, and I will send the PowerPoint along with that, along with some other uh, helpful resources that we have. So yes, all of this will be made available to you. Okay, and I just have a comment if that's okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, when I first I was a teacher for 24 years, and now I'm working in the drug and alcohol prevention, but. I had some really good advice from my first principal, and it reminds me of youth-led prevention. He told me, he said, 
Don't be a sage on the stage. Be a guide on the side. I like that. Very good. Yeah. yeah. Well, I've heard that before, but that's a great saying, and it really that is really what youth led's about. Yeah, or like a prompter. Yeah, yeah. very good. Yeah, oh, you're like a different. Yeah, that's great. So I just it made me think of those things, and I wanted to share that. I love yeah, that. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for sure, being Rebecca, with us today. From anyone else out there. We feel like we can go out and start our youth led programs. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited that um, all of you were invested today enough to to listen, and hopefully um, it was helpful. Hopefully it gave you some background on youth led programming and how you can really apply it. And again, like Christy and Mary said, these academies are going to be really beneficial to kind of that that proving ourselves because unfortunately in our field we do we have to prove ourselves and prove what we're doing is good and effective and that our youth are being changed as a result um, so I appreciate you taking your time and being invested in this um, and hopefully again you, there's some resources you can take to share with other folks and um, following this webinar again I'll send the link um, so if you wanted to follow up if you want to listen or share um, the PowerPoint and some other um, youth-led sort of resources that might benefit you all. Thank so, you. Yeah, no problem. Any any other questions before we before we part? No. Nope. Thank okay. you guys. Thank you, and thank, thank you, Christy and Mary, for um, doing a wonderful job on the webinar today. Um, and feel free to connect with us at any time. Um, here is my contact information. Um, so if you need anything, please feel free to contact me. Thanks a lot, everyone. Okay. Thank you. Everyone. Good luck with your work. We need it. <laughs> oh, you'll be great. I know it. All right, thanks. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.